than a wicked and hip hop. Bad, bad, and a wicked and Okay, all right, we are starting now today. So uh, still the same administrative stuff, right? Project uh, three is due on Sunday, November 14th, and homework four is due on uh, Wednesday, November the 10th, right? And uh, for next week, we actually have uh, the company Vertica come CMU to I mean, virtually to give uh, this database talk. Vertica is actually co a company uh, spin off by my advisor's advisor, uh, Michael Stoneberg from, Stonebreaker from MIT. Is um, one of the uh, modern implementation of a column store, and I think it was later um, bought by HP, and um, I mean, right now it's bought by another company, right? But they are going to talk, come and tell tell us about what they are doing uh, in the space of a column store, all right? <laughs> so uh, today's lecture would be the uh, last lecture on concurrency control. So uh, hopefully at this point people are still following. Uh, if the, the topic are a little bit dense uh, and, uh, and complex. Uh, these two weeks, uh, well, this kind of like the one of the most uh, challenging or complicated topics uh, we are discussing in this course, right? But today is the last one, last lecture on this topic of concurrency control. Right? Hope everyone is uh, still um, hanging, hanging there. Okay. So um, last class we talk about uh, the uh, technique of doing optimistic concurrency control, right? Especially uh, there are two. Specific algorithms we talk about, right? Basic time series, time series ordering, as well as optimistic concurrency control, right? And then last week we talked about uh, pessimistic concurrency control with locking as well, right? So uh, one thing I ended up last uh, lecture was that just beyond the uh, fundamental theory of serializability, there are actually cases where you are going to uh, insert or delete tuples, right? And in that case, there could be additional issues like a phantom uh, to make the result of your query quote unquote incorrect. And because uh, there, are, there are many different potential issues, and even without considering phantom, uh, to deal with all the conflicts, right, to make sure everything to be serializable, and we, we also talk about lots of things and lots of uh, things we got to do, uh, which essentially uh, can be costly and have uh, additional overhead, right? So in database systems, in actuality, Systems actually usually allow users to specify lower isolation level than serializability, right? That's what we end up uh, talking about last week. Essentially, at the highest level, serializable level, you don't allow phantom and you don't allow any, uh, the, uh, any of those conflicts we talk about, right? And, but in the second level, repeatable reads, you actually allow phantom uh, to happen, but then you ensure the, uh, there's no cycle in the uh, conflict dependency graph we talk about in our concurrency control theory class, right? So it will allow uh, more scheduling, uh, uh, and there's less overhead to check the phantom as well, but uh, it has this potential issue. And next level, you can even allow uh, unrepeatable reads, right? So uh, again, enable more scheduling, but potential, uh, potentially problematic result, right? Depending on whether your application can allow, allow that. And lastly, read uncommitted, you just allow anything to happen. Right? <laughs> so this would be the um, matrix of what isolation level you may get, as well as what kind of a problem or anomaly you may allow. Just note that when uh, the database system is set to be a lower isolation level, for example, read committed, then it's just possible that the database system would have unrepeatable read or phantom, right? It, does, it, it, it doesn't have to have. Right? In some cases, if the workload is simple, it may not have that. And in some system, right, because of how the system is built, right, how the components are designed, even though you specify at a lower isolation level, it will actually give you something stronger. Right? So, so at a lower isolation level, it could have those problems, but it doesn't not necessarily always have those anomalies. Right? Okay. So uh, generally speaking, right, when you are allowing a lower and, and a lower isolation levels, uh, of course you can do less and less checks and then allow more and more potential scheduling of the transactions, right? <laughs> so uh, just take the uh, two-phase locking, for example, right, if you're assuming that we are using uh, two-phase locking as our concurrency control protocol, then under the serializable level, right, you're going to check the phantom, for example, using the uh, index lock that we talked about last class, and for example, strict 2PL, right, then you will achieve serializable. But then, if you only want to achieve uh, repeatable reads, then at this isolation level, you only need a strict 2PL, right? You uh, do not need uh, this uh, index lock uh, on the phantom problem that we talked about 
last class. <laughs> and then again, if you go to a read committed, then you, you will still use uh, strict 2PL, but then, sorry, it's not strict anymore, right? You'll use, still use 2PL, but then you can actually uh, release the share lock immediately after uh, you use it, right? Then, I mean, you would achieve this read committed isolation level. Again, allow more scheduling, but then potentially have the unrepeatable read problem. <laughs> and then lastly, read uncommitted, I mean, you just, uh, just, just no share lock, right? Uh, it depends, right? In some cases, you have exclusive lock, some cases not, but essentially you don't need share lock, right? And this isolation level is in fact a SQL standard, right? Remember last class we talked about you, that way system can allow user to specify, hey, I, I want to lock this entire table right now. That's actually not a SQL standard, right? Users can provide this hint or if they don't, really want, don't want to provide, that's fine. But this um, isolation level is actually part of the CQ standard, right? And most of the system will allow users to specify a stronger or lower isolation level depending on uh, what, uh, what their application needs. Right? <laughs> And then, of course, you, if you don't specify, system would provide a default isolation level, right? And here is like a just summary as actually made by a uh, former uh, professor from Stanford called Peter Billis, but now he's doing his own startup thing. Um, but, but either way, uh, that's the table that he, he uh, made that summarized the default isolation level as, as the maximum isolation level across different systems, right? So, so one interesting thing we can immediately notice here is that only two systems set their default uh, isolation level to be serializable, right? Even though most of the theory, right, most of the um, analysis we talk about are developed by a database, uh, I mean, uh, database researchers over the years will focus on serializability, but actually in practice, because of the performance implementation, most systems, I mean, just by default, only give you a lower serialization, serialization, sorry, isolation level. And most of them would just give you read committed by default if you don't specify explicitly. And for many systems, right, they don't even uh, provide serializability as the highest isolation level, right? Because just because it's, um, it's difficult to implement and potentially uh, uh, restrict the performance quite a lot, so many systems don't even have that. And be, uh, beyond the um, uh, serializable read committed, un uh, repeatable reads as well as uncommitted uh, level we talk about, there's actually a interesting uh, additional isolation level called snapshot isolation, right? That's actually the maximum um, uh, isolation level can be achieved by, I mean, the famous Oracle database, right? So they don't even provide serializable, serializable even, though, even if you want. Um, but this is, <laughs> we'll get a little bit of detail into the snapshot isolation later. Essentially, uh, this is some isolation level that is also a little bit lower than serializability, right? But we'll talk about details about this later in this class, all right? And then, uh, uh, I think it's uh, two or three years ago, uh, our group uh, essentially did a survey on many DBAs about what isolation level, uh, DBA just means database administrator, right? We did this survey. Uh, to ask about what isolation levels that you are setting on the databases that you are managing, right? So here are the results. <laughs> Essentially, if you look at the serializable column on the right, right? If you look at the, the, the column, not, no single DBA will specify all the databases as serializable, right? So because of their application, because of performance consideration, there will always be some uh, instances they are managing that is actually not serializable. <laughs> and the most, um, uh, isolation level that people would resolve to is actually just this uh, read committed. So it's actually unclear to me, at least, that whether people use read committed the most because that's just the, the default isolation level by most systems, right? And they don't really change, or that's because of they thought through their application uh, property and characteristics, and they just determine that, hey, they only need read committed, but nothing more, nothing less, right? That, it's actually the part I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but that just turns out to be what most people use, right? Then the last note on this, uh, um, uh, I mean, isolation level uh, thing is that, well, it's not exactly isolation level, but um, last note on the SQL standard thing is that uh, in SQL standard, there's actually a uh, specific uh, uh, command that would allow user to give hints on whether a transaction is entirely read-only or not, right? If the database system know in advance that uh, this entire transaction is read-only, then maybe there could also be a potential optimizations. Right? But it's not impl implemented by uh, all systems. All right. 
Oh, but you can specify that, just uh, not all system would actually do corresponding optimization even if you uh, specify it, it's read only, all right? <laughs> okay, so that's about isolation level. Before I jump into today's class, multi-version, any questions? Okay, am I following? Cool, so today's class, again, is the last topic on the uh, uh, topic of concurrency control, and it is uh, it's last, but it's also a very, very important one, right? So essentially today, we are not going to talk about a specific concurrency control protocol. Instead, what we're talking about is actually a optimization that many, many, many uh, systems would apply, uh, just uh, in combination with the uh, earlier concurrency control protocols we talk about, right? This specific optimization would be called multivariate concurrency control. I mean, even though it has the name of concurrency control here, it's not a specific protocol. Instead, it could be used in combination with any of the protocols we talked about earlier, right? Either locking, optimistic, timestamp, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so the fundamental idea of multivariant concurrency control is that the database system is going to uh, I mean, instead of uh, the, the earlier protocol, right, the system only has one centralized or global physical copy of the record, right? No matter whether you lock it or you uh, have some copies of the record in your private space, in, from the global perspective, right, there's only one centralized physical record earlier in the class we talk about. But here with the multi-version, the, the, the intuition is that what if we can maintain multiple physical, physical copies of a record in the, in the global space for a specific single uh, logical record object, right? Then if we do that, would it be possible that this allow us to uh, have more, even more flexible uh, scheduling of the transactions, allow more parallelism or concurrency, higher throughput, lower latency, et cetera, right? And the, the uh, high level idea is just that when every transaction writes a new object, instead of write that object in place, right, in the global uh, centralized location, why, what if we, can, we just uh, keep all the original records intact, intact, and then we just write a new copy of the, of, of the new records, right? Then we have uh, different copies of this record, and then other transactions can either read the current copy created by myself or older copies, right? So this potentially can allow more flexible scheduling. And now uh, I'm going to uh, more details on this. So a little bit of history. Uh, again, <laughs> multiverse, the idea of multiverse concurrency control is, is not new either. It's, uh, well, people generally view the, uh, the first, uh, the first time it was proposed is in a thesis from MIT, uh, in 1987, uh, sorry, 1978, right? And then the, uh, very first, uh, few implementations of this idea of multivariant concurrency control would be in the early 80s and then implemented, uh, specifically in two systems, right? One is called RDB and the other is called Interbase. And they are, they both came from DEC and both architect by this person called, uh, James Starkey. And now he's, uh, became a, he's like, now he's doing his, uh, another startup again, right? Called, uh, NeoDB. And then later on, uh, this, um, I mean, RDB system was acquired by Oracle, would be called Oracle RDB. But note that this is actually different than the, uh, Oracle database you normally use, right? So there's that. I mean, there's the uh, Oracle uh, database I invented in, I forgot, the 70s, 80s, right? Is used uh, and updated until now. But then they also, uh, acquired, Oracle, the company also acquired this, uh, early, uh, database system called RDB and then renamed it to be Oracle RDB. And lastly, uh, the interbase was just uh, later, later on open sourced, and now it's called uh, Firebase, right? So this is actually the first of two implementations uh, with this idea of uh, multivariate concurrency control. There's the two systems are still, uh, I mean, active today, right? Or at least used by people today, right? Okay, <laughs> so again, the multivariate concurrency control, right? You have a multiple uh, variance of a multiple physical variance of a single a logical record or object. And then the main advantage of this multivariant concurrency control would be that writers and readers uh, do not block each other, right? Uh, so say, for example, if you are a writing transaction, then when you write a new record, I mean, all the, I mean, for, for example, you write a new record to a, a specific uh, object, right? Then if there are other running transactions that are still reading the earlier version of this tuple, I mean, they are not I I affected, right? So because you are not deleting any record, so existing transactions, if they are using, if they read uh, some version of the, this record earlier, 
then they can still able to, they are still able to continue, right? So the writers will not block readers and, and vice versa. Of course, I mean, writers and writers would affect each other, right? Otherwise, you would have a conflict. And then, uh, especially uh, in this, under this, uh, uh, I mean, uh, implementation or optimization of multi-order concurrency control, it al would allow read-only transactions to be able to uh, read a consistent snapshot of the database system without acquiring any lock. So by reading a consistent snapshot, what do we, what do we mean is just that when the transactions are trying to access tuples, right, it could access tuples, any, any tuple it access would be all at a version that is exactly at the starting point uh, of this transaction, right? So essentially, this transaction, again, if it's a read-only, it could read a consistent version of the entire database system at a particular point of time, right? So, and all, all the data it read would be, uh, would come from the transactions committed after that time point, and any modification after that time point would not be read by this transaction. And this, this read-only transaction can do that without acquiring any logs, right? So again, this could, uh, you can see that this could potentially give us uh, lots of uh, potential uh, performance improvement. And uh, that's just exactly what snapshot isolation means, right? It just means that a transaction is reading a, a, the, the state of the database at a particular time point that it can only seize the versions of the tuples committed by transactions earlier than that, but nothing after, right? Yeah. So again, to note that this uh, snapshot isolation level is still not serializable, right? So even though it will not really have the, um, the basic conflicts we talk about in the concurrency control theory class, like a dirty read, dirty write, and the uh, writing to uncommitted data, it will not have those basic problems, but then it will also, it would have a problem called the write skew, right? So we would still make it um, not serializable, but it, but, uh, it, it at least is also, it's, it's already a pretty strong isolation level. Okay, and lastly, uh, with this uh, multi-version idea, it's also easy to support a type of query called time travel queries, which just essentially means that you can uh, ask the query to, um, to, to check or to uh, query the, uh, the state of the database, again, at a particular time point uh, back in time, right? So this is very straightforward. With different versions and with the snapshot isolation, you can easily specify a timestamp and say that, hey, I only want to read two posts, uh, uh, with versions before or exactly at this timestamp, right? So that's just a very easy to support queries of that kind. All right. <laughs> so let me uh, give you uh, some examples, right? So here, uh, see that we have uh, two transactions, and then we have uh, we only look at this one record A, right? So first of all, is that for the illustration purpose, I'm uh, denoting uh, this uh, version of the tuple here, but in actuality, there's no this field. The database don't really maintain this field, right? Just something uh, for illustration. So instead, what the database will maintain would be uh, the uh, begin and end timestamp for each version of a particular uh, record. In this case, would be a tuple, right? <laughs> and then we, we have this uh, value could be uh, this just the value of this tuple. Okay, so uh, say we have two transactions here, right? Transaction uh, T1 and T2. And here, we are going to assign timestamp to the transactions at the beginning uh, of their execution, right? So even though last class when we talk about um, OCC, we say, hey, usually uh, optimistic concurrency control, you only need to generate timestamp for a transaction at the validation phase. But here, because we need to use uh, the timestamp to determine which version this, uh, each transaction is going to read and write, we have to uh, assign a timestamp for each transaction at the beginning of its execution, all right? <laughs> so here, and the transaction T1 will give it the timestamp 1, T2 give it timestamp 2. At the beginning, transaction T1 is going to read uh, uh, record A, right? And then here, I mean, because uh, uh, this uh, transaction, this is begin and end timestamp uh, is, well, the timestamp of a transaction A, which is 1, is between the range of the begin and end timestamp of uh, this uh, particular record, right? Then it can uh, read this record and continue, right? <laughs> here, transaction uh, two comes along and want to uh, write uh, the record A. So here, instead of overwriting this uh, version zero of this uh, tuple A, what we do is that we are going to create a new version uh, for this tuple, right, called, called A1, and then with, uh, with a different value and also with the begin timestamp as the timestamp of the writing transaction would be two, right? <laughs> and the end stamp, timestamp would just be a placeholder here, right? Say infinity or not, right? Doesn't really matter. And then, of course, 
then this earlier version would become old, right? So while I'm writing uh, this, uh, this uh, second record, oh, sorry, second version of this record, I'm going to set the end timestamp of the earlier version to be two, right? So this earlier version A0 would only be valid uh, for the transactions uh, between this time range, right? So all, all the later transactions, right, with a timestamp greater than or equal to two, they need to go to the newer version, all right? So the, in this case, we are try, trying to guarantee that uh, each transaction based on its timestamp and the position in the entire scheduling, they should read the correct versions, right, generated by uh, the cor corresponding transactions, right, following the uh, ser serial order defined, defined by the timestamp, right? So another thing uh, to note that here is that um, we, be beyond this uh, begin and end timestamp of uh, each transaction, we actually need to have a uh, separate, um, separate location so that we keep track of the uh, status of uh, all the transactions, whether they have uh, committed or not, right? Because sometimes if we, <laughs> for, you just put them here, right? If transaction T2 writes a new version uh, to, this, uh, to, this, um, um, to this record A, then it, 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 before it commits, right, other transactions, depending on the isolation level, right, but for example, in serializable, other transaction couldn't really uh, see this, this version, right, because this uh, transaction two has not committed yet, right. Other transactions, if uh, they uh, come along later, uh, they should not uh, see this, uh, this version yet, so uh, you need to keep track of which committed or which not, and so that otherwise uh, there might be conflict. And we'll get to the more details later. So here, transaction, uh, transaction one comes back, right? Then here, what happens here is that because transaction has a timestamp one, right? Now it wants to read uh, the two record A or tuple A again, but here, the, the timestamp is only between the range zero and two, right? Because that's the uh, starting time point of this transaction. And then at that point, it can only see uh, this uh, version A0, but it cannot see the uh, version that has a uh, bigger beginning timestamp that's written by a transaction that is scheduled later, right? Because the transaction two has a higher timestamp than one. So when transaction A reads, reads A again, it only see, sees the earlier version of A. And then this would not generate unrepeatable read, right? Because otherwise, if you have only a single version, transaction to modify this tuple, then it will be unrepeatable read, right? But in this case, we avoid that issue. Right, okay. And then, uh, yeah, lastly, uh, transaction to uh, you can just uh, commit regularly, all right? Here, another example, right? Just to uh, give you a, a different look on this, still, Transaction A, read A, right, uh, and then it can read, just to read uh, this version, uh, current version, and then transaction A did a write on A, right, and then here, so uh, create a new version, and with the beginning timestamp of one, right, again, end timestamp would be set to infinity. <laughs> and here, it needs to modify the end timestamp of transaction, oh sorry, of tuple, of, of the A0 version of uh, tuple A, and to be, to be one, right, corresponding to uh, this transaction one. And later on, transaction two comes along and start first to read tuple A, and then now, which version should it use, right? Because we see that uh, the, in the, in the uh, transaction status table, transaction one is still active, right? <laughs> so even though transaction two comes after transaction one, so if transaction one commits, of obviously, it should be able to see uh, the uh, value of uh, the written by the transaction, written by transaction one, right? But because transaction one has not committed yet, right? Reading uh, this uh, value from this version A1 right now would actually be a dirty read, right? Or, or reading uncommitted data essentially. So because we have this um, status of the, all the transactions in the table and we know that it has not been committed yet, and then we uh, just to check that, and then instead of reading the newer version, we are still reading this earlier version of, of this tuple, right? So even though we have this uh, end timestamp that is I mean, smaller than two, but because we have this table, we are still be able to uh, read a earlier version, all right? And then later on, transaction two uh, comes along and then try to write uh, this, this record. <laughs> so here, it, it um, well, because transaction one is, is still writing, right? So for example, assuming that we are using a uh, locking protocol, right? Assuming uh, 
yeah, so transaction one is still writing. And now because, uh, because transaction two also needs to write, right now it, it, it needs to uh, acquire a occlusive lock as well, right? Again, assuming that we are using a locking concurrent sequential protocol for now, then transaction two has to stall and wait for transaction one to commit. So here, transaction one come back and read this version, right? It's the same version. It reads the same version that's written by itself, and then later on it commits, right? So here, transaction one status became commit, right? So now, when transaction two wants to commit, then transaction two can, can see that, hey, transaction one already finished it, right? It already did all its modification, and then the, this, the modification is already, all, all the modifications are in effect in the uh, database table. Uh, so here, again, depending on the isolation level you specify, right? So uh, on the, the highest level of serializable, you may not be able to commit this transaction, but then under a snapshot isolation, right? Because it's, it's only requirement is that every transaction only sees a consistent snapshot of the entire state of the database at a particular time point. Then at this point, if the isolation level is a little bit lower, transaction two can actually uh, commit as well. Right? And then eventually uh, write this new version uh, to the database and then change its commit status. All right, so any question in terms of uh, how do we maintain this uh, timestamp logically, right? I haven't talked about implementation yet, but logically, how do we maintain and modify the timestamp of uh, different transactions based on what they read or write? Any questions? No? All right, cool. So, <laughs> this, um, so this is actually a very, very uh, important optimization uh, that uh, systems uh, that, that came up uh, in, in the, uh, under the uh, challenge of concurrency control. And in fact, most of the systems, right? I think most of the systems in the, uh, in the late, latest 10, 20 years, they implement this uh, optimization uh, with uh, multivariate concurrency control. Right? And this is actually just a bunch of systems that, that we collected that have implemented this, uh, this uh, technique. And you can see uh, most of the system, well, there are many, many systems that, uh, that do this. And it improved uh, the uh, performance of the heavy system, especially the uh, effectiveness of a concurrency control protocol by a lot, right? So this is like a very, very important optimization. So now I'm going to uh, switch to the demos and show you the uh, effect of this uh, multi-version concurrency control, right? especially uh, in the context of Postgres. So hopefully uh, this time it can go smoother than, than last time. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So, oh, one second. It's not. All right, this is Postgres. <laughs> So again, if anyone sit in behind and cannot see this demo, uh, please come forward. I already tried to make the font a little bit larger, right? So hopefully you can see it better, but I don't know whether you can exactly see it. Let me put this here. All right, uh, everyone can see that, all right? So, oh, for, Ah, sorry, for this system, I need to actually need to log in again. I, uh... mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, <laughs> okay, uh, if I does that. Uh... Okay, okay, cool. It's able to connect. Now, what we do here is that, again, similar to last time, we have this transaction demo table, right, with only uh, two records. Uh, record one, IDE value 100, record two, uh, uh, ID, ID two, value 200, right? So see, this is like the, the two um, tuples here. And then, at the beginning, what we can do is that, uh, let me come to the, uh, this come to this one, sorry. We can use this query, right, <laughs> to ask Postgres to return not only the uh, value of this uh, each tuple, but also return the um, position of this tuple, right? This is like a CTID. I don't know whether Andrew has showed you guys with demos before <laughs> with the CTID. No? 
Okay, so here, we, okay, so step back. We, we are selecting three additional fields uh, from uh, all the tuples uh, in, this, uh, in this table, right? Instead of, besides ID and value, we are also selecting CTID, XMIN, and MX. CTID is actually the uh, location of this tuple, right? It's essentially the ID of the page, as well as the um, position of which slot uh, this tuple is in that table. Uh, this combination will help you locate the content of this tuple on disk, all right? <laughs> And then x min and x, x max will just be the begin timestamp and the end timestamp uh, of um, of this uh, particular tuple. And obviously, I mean, with this, we know that Postgres is using multivariate concurrency control, right? I think I, I think my CQ as well. Okay. <laughs> so uh, with this, um, what we are going to do first? Okay. First, uh, we can notice that every trans every um, uh, uh, tuple, all the tuples here, right, would have the same mean and uh, same max, right? This means that it's being, uh, all these tuples would be created uh, by a transaction with a timestamp uh, 498, right? For the max timestamp, it's zero, but I, I think it's just a placeholder. Right? It's like zero, infinity, I, I think that's the same thing, right? All right? So what we are going to do here is that <laughs> at the beginning, we are going to execute the transaction at the uh, read committed level, right? Not the highest level yet. Show up here? Okay, show up there. Nice. So what we do is that we are going to first look at the, um, the uh, two posts, right, here for this transaction, right? So again, it's a, it's a similar thing we, we saw earlier, right? It's exactly the same thing. And then, for the second, and actually, for better demonstration, we probably can also look at the ID of the transaction as well, right? This transaction ID would be uh, 499, and then for the second transaction, the ID would be 500, all right? It's two different transactions. So now, <laughs> what we are going to do is that we are going to issue an update query on the first transaction, and then, you, you only update the record with the ID equals to one, all right? So right now, the uh, first record would already have uh, two variants already, right? So now, let's come back and see what we can see here, right? So here, what we can see is that even though the first transaction update this two port, right? It's the same, right? ID equals to one. <laughs> But here, from the second transaction's perspective, right, because the trans second transaction has a higher timestamp, 500, uh, oh, this is not correct. It's because the first transaction has not committed yet, right? So the second transaction, even though it has a higher timestamp, 500, when it comes back, it can still, it can only see the, uh, the original version of this, uh, of this record, right? Which is, I mean, just uh, the version, initial version uh, we see with uh, position zero and one. <laughs> and here, for the uh, definition of X max, I mean, uh, this, yeah, because the first transaction with um, ID 499 modified this record, then the max timestamp or the end timestamp of this record is changed to a 499, right? So the next thing you may wonder is that hey, what if I select this as the tuple explicitly, right? So like I mentioned here, the first city ID, which just means that the page ID as well as the slot number, then what if we know that we have uh, two logical tuples, but we have a third version, right? What if I directly tell the system, hey, I want to know uh, this, I want to see this version at this location, right? What will happen? And if you think uh, the system should be able to see this record or not? It cannot, right? <laughs> so because even though we know that there's this tuple, right, at this location, but logically, right, this first transaction has not committed yet. Even though I query this tuple, sure, I can, I know, I know its ID, know its I mean, attribute or whatever, right, select it, but then at the end of the day, when doing the concurrency control, the system is not going to allow the second transaction to see that uncommitted tuple, right, even though it has all these variants, all right? So now, come back to the uh, first transaction, right? Let's see, just give you a double check, right? 
when the first transaction uh, try to select this uh, tuple from this table, it, it is it's selecting the version that uh, it has written before. Right? So this is at a position zero three. All right. So the next thing I'm going to do is that what if now I come back and update this tuple again, right? So you see, so here, because we are trying to update the same tuple, right? So depending on the implementation, so here, Postgres is actually uh, doing, again, is where we show this la la uh, two class before, right? Postgres is doing uh, a pessimistic log concurrency control. So similar to the example I showed in class, when you issue this update command, because transaction T1 is already updating it, transaction T2 will just store here, right? And then now, Let's just uh, commit this uh, transaction earlier. You see, right after I commit the first transaction, then, I mean, the transaction uh, two can just uh, continue and then uh, uh, do the modification, right? So here, let me just uh, commit this transaction as well, right? So here we can, where's the, yeah, oh, sorry, yeah, there's the, we can come back and then, uh, select everything out again, right? <laughs> so here, yeah. So one thing that I'm, I'm actually personally not exactly sure, I mean, I, I, this is like the same when I was trying it. So here, the second, sorry, the first record, right, ID equals to one, when we finish modification, it's actually have a max timestamp also equals to 500. Uh, I, I don't know why, so I, I thought it should be zero. So maybe 500 is also a placeholder the same as zero, right? If it's a same value or zero, maybe it's all like a to, to infinity. I don't really know, right? But I think uh, theoretically speaking, right? If you have, it, it should, well, not theoretically, it just should just set the end timestamp for this record to be uh, to be infinity, right? But what, I don't know why here is 500, but not zero, right? Maybe just uh, somehow Postgres uh, use both to, to determine, to, to denote infinity, right? I don't really know. Okay, that's the first example that I, I wanted to show. Here, I want to show you an example, what if I increase the serialize, uh, the isolation level a little bit, right? All right, here in the transaction, I'm here, you restart this transaction, and then I begin the transaction with a serializable isolation level, all right? Actually, <laughs> before doing that, uh, any question on the first example I show? Yes, please. Four nine eight zero. Yeah. Yes. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's ID equals two. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No worries. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Yeah. Uh, any transaction on the earlier example? Sorry, any questions on the earlier example? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's start this. Uh, this again, but with a higher isolation level. Right. Again, we should look at the uh, ID of this transaction. Uh, 501, 502, all right? So what we are going to do here is that for the first one, right? Okay, let me, let me, uh, let me for, for, for the record, right? Let me just uh, yeah, select uh, this, um, this, uh, what's it called? Uh, this is this tuple, right, from this uh, table as well, right? Just to uh, show you uh, this, what would be this record as well as put the, the um, transaction ID as here as well, right, just for the record. But it's, uh, it's the same, same value we see, we've seen before, okay? So here, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to first, again, update uh, this, uh, this transaction. Uh, up, up, update the uh, value of the record ID, record with ID one in this transaction, but also I'm just re, uh, have this syntax to returning the ID of this transaction, right? So 501, okay? So here, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to do the same thing, right? I'm going to do this update again, right? Similarly, up, up until now, Similar to what we seen last time, this uh, the the transaction, there's a second transaction is stored, right? Because we are updating the same record, all right, at the same time. Okay, so 
now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to commit the first transaction. But before I'm going to do that, I want to remind you that the last time we did the same thing, right? What happened to the second transaction when you commit the first? The second transaction is, is, is just a, the, the, it's just unstalled, right? The second transaction is allowed to continue, and then it's allowed to modify the record, and then continue, right? But here, when I see, when I hit commit, you see what happened to the second transaction? Second transaction says that it is, could not uh, serialize, could not have a serialized serializable access, right? Because there's a concurrent update here. Why is that? Well, because we specified serializable isolation level at the beginning of both transactions, right? So this essentially, this is a higher isolation level. And in serializable isolation, we're not going to allow uh, these two transactions to update uh, this, um, this uh, record at a schedule, uh, essentially at a, at, a, at a schedule with conflicts that could form a cycle, right? Essentially, it will be read-write conflict and write-write conflict. And then in this case, we are, we are not going to allow this transaction to continue, all right? And then here, uh, I think I just I cannot commit, right? It just uh, it says zero spec, right? Because this transaction has already been aborted. All right, make sense? Any questions? Okay, cool. So lastly, right, uh, and show you, uh, let's see, let me see what I can. Okay, so I will show you a little bit the mix of this um, transaction isolation level, right? So here, <laughs> again, in the first transaction, I start this transaction with a serializable. And then for second transaction, I start with the read uncommitted, right? So it's like a one high level and one low level, right? Let's see what's going to happen here, all right? Okay, similar here, right? So I can select everything from this uh, table, right? I mean, you see, this, this has a record, uh, the max, the, well, the, yeah, the, 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 for the first record, the uh, n timestamp or x max became back to zero, right? That's what, what, what I expect to see. But I don't know why in the earlier example it shows the same. But essentially these are the two tuples, right? And then here, what I can do is that I can, yeah, similar stuff, select everything, right? You see two transactions seeing exactly the same thing. And then I can do a update Yes, do we update on this uh, transaction? But in this time, very differently, I'm updating the tuple ID equals to two, right? See, that's what I'm doing here differently. And also I return the uh, current transaction um, ID or timestamp, okay? So now when I come back, I'm going to do a update on the tuple ID equals to one, right? Okay, so now uh, this, this transaction also proceeds, right? Because it's, it's doing an update on a different tuple. And what I want to do is that I want to do a select, select query, right? On this, uh, on this particular uh, table. And what do we see here, right? Here we see that for the uh, first I mean, tuple ID equals to one, it is seeing the latest value it is written, right? But then for the other R value, right, with ID, or other tuple with ID equals to two, it does not see the latest value, right? It is still seeing the uh, value that is earlier, right? Because the begin timestamp of the tuple with ID equals to two is 498, right? That's like a value, that's a transaction we executed earlier, right? Uh, and then the end timestamp is 503, right? That's because the second transaction with ID 503 installed a new version and then changed the end timestamp of the first transaction to be uh, 503, right? And here, what's interesting here is that I want to select all the tuples, right? from uh, this second transaction now. <laughs> and remember that we are executing the second transaction as read uncommitted, right? That's what the, that's, that's, everybody remember, right? That's the isolation level that we specify for the second transaction at the beginning. So in theory, what should we be able to see here? 
right, if we do like, execute this query, because I'm specified is really uncommitted, right? It's, it's not required to protect anything. Then in theory, I should be able to see the latest version of I mean, no matter written by whichever transaction, right? Because it's not protecting anything. But when we when I actually execute this transaction, what we are seeing here, right? We are seeing that the the first version, let's see. The the second transaction is is modifying uh yeah, actually, what's the ID of this trans first transaction? I kind of forgot, right? <laughs> Let me uh, select this ID. Yes, 504, right, exactly. <laughs> so we can see that for the, so here, for the second transaction, right? So for the tuple two, that's what the second transaction has been modified, right? With this um, ID 503, right? That's the, for the ID, for the tuple ID equals to two, that's what's been modified by the second transaction, right? <laughs> but for the, for the ID equals to one, we see that we actually, even for the second transaction, running read uncommitted, it is still seeing the earlier version of the tuple with ID equals to one, right? It's actually not seeing a uncommitted tuple uh, written by uh, the first transaction. That makes sense? Because you see the first, uh, on the, on the second half of the, of this screen, right? When we select everything from the table, the, two, the tuple with ID equals to one still has a range between 501 and 504, right? So that's before the first transaction modified. So what's happening here, or what I want to show is that even though we specify the database system to run the second transaction as read uncommitted, that just means that the system is not obligated to protect this transaction uh, from uncommitted data, right? It could still choose to protect it, right? And in fact, in this case of Postgres, because it uses multi-version concurrency control, it's actually just much easier for them to just naturally uh, protect the range of the transaction based on the timestamp and find the correct version, right? If they want to let the section transaction to read a uncommitted version of the data, they actually need to implement some sort of a special logic, right? and then go beyond their uh, normal uh, concurrency control and version checking based on timestamp, right? Then they decide that it's not efficient and not, yeah, just not efficient and it's uh, complicated to do that. And then they just choose not to do that. So even th though you specify read uncommitted, I mean, they still guarantee that you uh, do not read data from uh, uncommitted transaction. Not guarantee, but they still don't let you uh, to read data from uncommitted transaction. All right, so that's just something that uh, the database system uh, can choose, okay? So that's all the demo today. Any questions? All right, cool. Let me come back and continue the rest of the lecture. Oh, sorry, this is from the beginning. <laughs> so, like I mentioned, uh, most of the system, like on the, on the earlier slides, right, most of the system in the past 10, 20 years would implement this uh, multi-version uh, concurrency control optimization and just give you a huge performance uh, benefit, right? So, uh, it's very, very important optimization. And then there are a few uh, specific aspects uh, in the database system, uh, well, specific aspects of this um, uh, concurrency control that we need to talk about in order to actually implement that uh, in a system and implement it efficiently, right? Um, so the first, obviously, would be uh, the combination of this uh, concurrency control optimization with the earlier concurrency control protocol we talk about, right? <laughs> but here, I'm actually not going to go into too much detail with examples, etc., because uh, at most, mostly, right, at, at at a high level, all those previous comparison control protocol will just stay the same. Right? It, you just uh, add a different, uh, add a new version when you are writing uh, to this uh, tuple, but then you are still doing the similar uh, ordering, optimistic comparison control, and locking. Right? For example, here, uh, if you want to combine 
multivariate coefficient control with timestamp ordering, well, I mean, you, you would still assign transaction with timestamps and then arrange the execution uh, of these, uh, uh, or the scheduling of these transactions based on the earlier timestamps, right? Is, I think the only, only difference is that in this case, you don't need to um, keep a, uh, the special read timestamp anymore, right? Because you all have begin and end timestamp uh, for each transaction already. But then uh, the optimistic concurrency control, again, it's, it's the same uh, three-phase uh, validation, the read, validation, and write phase we talked about earlier. The only difference is that right now uh, in the uh, private workspace, you will just uh, install new versions in those private workspace, right? Instead of uh, uh, put a new versions uh, immediately uh, in this uh, global, global table, right? So uh, lastly, for the two-phase locking, again, very, very similar. Uh, the only difference is that instead of locking a, like a global single physical copy of this tuple, you are going to lock the specific version of the tuple that you are trying to access, right? So you are trying to read a earlier version of the tuple with, with um, ID 100, then you are just put a shared lock on the specific version with ID 100, right? Similar with the write, if you want to write to a tuple, you're going to just write, put an exclusive lock on the uh, latest uh, version of the tuple. Right? That essentially put an exclusive lock on the, or the write lock on the tuple. Right? No other transaction can write to that tuple anymore at the same time. But at a high level, all, all those um, protocols stay the same. Right? So, and, and yeah, unfortunately, due to time, I'm not going to go into examples for them. So what I want to talk about is also, uh, is kind of, is pretty interesting here, is that how do you actually, uh, organize the storage of those uh, additional versions and how do you traverse them, how do you clean them up. Right? Those are actually uh, very interesting and important topics uh, in terms of implement this multivariant concurrency control efficiently. <laughs> the first is version storage. How do you store these uh, tuples? So a high level concept here is that for uh, all these um, different versions of the tuples, right, we are going to Different, different physical versions of the same logical tuple. We are going to chain those, turn, chain them together using pointers, right? So essentially, in each tuple, in each physical a copy of a version of a tuple, we are going to have a specific field where we store a pointer pointing to the next version, next physical version of this logical tuple, right? And then there we are going to chain everything together so that we can uh, traverse this chain and find the correct version of a tuple if a transaction wants to access it. And then, um, well, the another thing to note is that the index, well, because in many cases, uh, in, for example, you have a B plus three index or hash index, the, the record or the value uh, of that leaf node in the index will just pointing to the head of this version chain, right? And then it, later on, uh, the transaction will just traverse this version chain to find the uh, correct tuple. And then there are different uh, storage uh, schemas, strategies, uh, different methods with different trade-offs, right? So now I'm going to talk about them. So there, there are, at high level, there are essentially uh, three ways to organize the storage of these uh, additional versions of tuples. The first is kind of straightforward, just be called append only. Right? So essentially, every time you need to write a new record, you're just going to uh, append this new record to the end of the uh, storage space of the entire tuple, sorry, entire table, and then you're going to um, adjust the pointer accordingly, right? And it's very straightforward. And the second will be called a time travel storage. So it's, 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 it's similar, but almost the reverse way is that instead of writing a, a um, new version of the tuple to, a, uh, to, the, to, the, to the end of the table space, what time travel storage do is that it will have a separate uh, table space that store all the old versions, right? So essentially, when, every time when a transaction wants to write a new version, it will first copy the current version, right, the existing or original version of this tuple to the separate storage space, to the end of the separate storage space that store all the old tuples, right? And then it will just update uh, the, or the, this, um, this, this like, current version of this tuple in place right, to be the latest version. So the location of the current tuple never change under this uh, time travel storage, all right? So a little bit different. The third one is, again, is, you can see it's kind of like a little bit of modification or extension on the second approach, which is that instead of copy the entire tuple, or entire, entire tuple with the original values, it will only look at 
what attributes of this tuple is going to be modified by the writing transaction, right? And then it will only copy the uh, columns of these uh, attributes or, 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 or copy these, the values of the columns to be modified to the uh, separate space, right? And then update the uh, new value in place instead of copying the entire tuple, right? So uh, the, uh, based on a few uh, latest research, it shows that uh, the third approach is typically uh, more advantageous, right? Essentially, I mean, on the third approach, you, uh, every time you do a write, you uh, write less data, right? It's, it's, it's more efficient, and the, the, also the changes or the, the, uh, the values of the old tuples, they occupy less space, and it's also easier to clean them up later on, right? So the, uh, a few little research shows that the third approach is, is probably better, um, but there are actually still system using the first or second approach, right? There, there are some trade-offs. So give you some uh, specific examples, right? <laughs> the first approach, append only. So in this case, all the physical versions of, this, um, of, of the tuples will just be all stored in this uh, single table space, right? And then there's, if they are not sorted by which tuple it is, right? So the different versions of different tuples will just be uh, interleaved uh, in, in this uh, table together, right? And then, for example, here, say I want to um, add a new version of this um, uh, tuple A, all right? Right now, already there are just a zero and a one exist. So what we do is that we just append a new version of this uh, tuple A to be A2 at the end of um, this uh, table space right, with the new value. And importantly, what do we also need to do? We also need to adjust the pointers between different versions of this tuple, right? So here, right, we uh, adjust this uh, pointer from a tuple A1 to a tuple A3, right? So originally, we have this chain, right? Originally, we have this chain of two tuples, right? Point from a tuple A, A0 to A1, and A1, that's the end of the chain, right? Now pointer or something. Uh, and then after the modification, then this chain is extended by one. All right? That's it. Any, any question? Straightforward, right? Okay. <laughs> so one uh, question you may ask is that, hey, what should be the order of, of, of this variant chain? Right, because you can you can really go both ways with this, right? You can either uh, do uh, this chain from the from the oldest point into the newest, and then you can also uh, organize this chain from the newest to the oldest, right? And there's there are actually kind of straightforward. I mean, people do both, right? By the way, but there are actually kind of straightforward trade-off between them. Right? <laughs> In the first approach, for example, from the oldest uh, to the newest, then the uh, benefit is that when you uh, append a new record, right, then just like we, we do we did here, we append a new record, we only need to append this new record to the end of the chain, right? We don't really need to uh, modify the uh, other, um, the, 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 uh, the, yeah, we don't need to, uh, we don't need to uh, update the pointer at a new location, right? Because uh, the, 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 the new version is only append to the end, right? But then the disadvantage here is that every time we want to traverse this chain, right? Because uh, presumably, right, the newer transactions or most transactions would want to access the newer value, right? Because the timestamp is advancing. Then the disadvantage is that every time you are, you, if you look at this chain, you are only going to look at the oldest version first, right? If you want to look at the newer version, you have to uh, traverse to the end of the chain, all right? But then on the uh, second approach, with the newest to the oldest, right, then, the, uh, the advantage here is that you are only going to look at the, uh, the well, you, you could be able to look at the newest version at the beginning, right? But then the disadvantage is that right now the head of the chain is, is he's keep changing, right? Because the, if you do newest to oldest, then the head of the chain is, all, or is always going to, pointed, to be pointed to the newest version of the tuple, right? So every time you insert a new tuple, you have to change the head of the chain to be pointed to the new location. In this case, we need to update the index. Okay, that makes sense? All right. So next, we're gonna talk about this uh, time travel storage, and we can actually see that uh, there are different implications uh, if you organize uh, them with uh, different orders as well, all right? <laughs> 
actually in this case, it, oh, actually that's a, that's a third, third approach, but in this case, uh, here we are just uh, assuming that we are using newest to oldest, right? Sorry, let me take a bit. Here, we are only assuming uh, we are using newest to oldest uh, for now, okay? So here, we are doing a time travel. Every time we want to update a record in, I mean, in the database, we are going to copy the old record to the separate uh, table space. We just call it time travel table. Just means that these are the tuples uh, from the oldest times, right? And they represent the value of the tuples in the history. So this is called a time travel table. And then we are going to update the pointers in the in the main table. Okay. Here, what we do is that say we want to uh, more, uh, update, give a new version of this uh, record A as well. We are going to first first find a spot of this for this uh, new version, or oh, sorry, for, for this record A in the time travel table. And we are going to copy the current version of A to that time travel table, all right? And then, of course, we have to update the pointer to uh, point into the uh, older version before that, right? That's be A2 point into A1. And then now, we are just going to override this version here to be the new value, right? That will be uh, 333, for example. Right. Then we just update this value in place. And the next thing we can do, what we should do, is that we need to update the pointer of this uh, new version, right, to point to the uh, the latest older version or the original version before that, right. So essentially, you always update in place. And then this is the newest uh, to oldest. And then the benefit, one benefit of this approach is that even though it is the newest to oldest, but then because you always update in place, you actually don't really need to change the pointer pointing to the head of the chain, right? Because the head of the chain is, is always in the main table, right? the location never changed. And another benefit of this approach is that you could actually, because all the old versions are in this time travel table, and again, in actuality, I mean, most transactions would actually just uh, uh, access tuples in the, uh, th that are recently written, and for the tuples that are written a while ago, I mean, in practice, you just rarely access them. So another advantage of this approach is that you, in fact, can take the entire time travel table uh, to a like, lower tier storage device, right? For example, a lower HDD. Then, I mean, you save money, and then you don't read them uh, that frequently anyway. Right, so it's probably uh, can be overall uh, money-wise uh, uh, more better. All right. Any questions with uh, time travel storage? Okay. So uh, lastly, uh, delta storage. <laughs> Again, so this is this is a sort of ex extension of the uh, time travel storage. Right. It's just instead of copying the entire tuple, you uh, copy the uh, specific values uh, modified uh, by the writing transaction. So here uh, the Okay, so so just to give you an illustration on this, right? So every time you want to update this tuple, say here you want to uh, update the only well for illustration purpose, I'm showing only showing you one value, right? But in act in actuality, you can imagine the table can have a thousand value, right? And you only need to look at one. But here, assume that the table uh, only has one attribute, right? Called a value, and the value of the value attribute is one on one, right? So when the transaction wants to write to this uh, value, what we do is that it will just uh, copy the value of this um, this value column to be to this uh, delta storage segment, right? And then, of course, uh, with every delta record, we'd also have a pointer. But this is since this is the first record, the pointer will just be a null pointer. And what you will do, you will just uh, maybe pointing the the make the pointer of this current version of A, which would be A2, pointing to the uh, original version. Right, and then, uh, right, right. You just uh, then uh, assuming that at, at uh, a, a while, I mean, for some time later, you want to update this uh, record A again. Right, I mean, assuming that you want to do an additional update. So what you do, you will just uh, copy the current value of A2 again to this uh, delta record uh, storage segment, and then pointing to uh, pointing the uh, make, make the pointer of A2 point to A1. Right here. You can just do the uh, modification, right, and then update the current value of A3 uh, to be uh, 333, and then make the make the pointer of A3 uh, point to A2, right. Then you uh, keep your version chain maintained with these uh, delta deltas. All right. <laughs>
Any question on this uh, delta storage? Okay. Oh, yes, yes please. Oh, no, yeah, no, actually not. This is a good question. <laughs> so for simplicity, I'm only showing you uh, one attribute here, but uh, uh, in actuality, you, you may write one or two or three attributes, right? So you actually write all those attributes uh, together in a single record. Oh, so that's almost the same as saving a tuple. Well, but depending on the, the width of this table, right? Say if the table has a thousand columns, right, or a thousand attributes, but then you only update three, then you will still be saving a lot, right? But, but yeah, yeah. But yeah, if, if the table has a thousand columns, you are updating a thousand columns, that's just the same as uh, the original, um, I mean, copy the entire tuple approach, all right? And <laughs> what to be note here is that what, wh when the, when, when the transaction wants to access those tuples, right, what needs to happen? So un, unlike the earlier two approaches that you just, I mean, keep traversing this version chain and uh, based on the uh, begin and end timestamp we talked about earlier, you directly look at these uh, tuples. <laughs> now, while you are traversing this version chain, you actually need to apply the changes back to the current tuple, right, because no, there's nowhere in the version chain we are storing the value of uh, all the tuples, right? So while you are traversing it, you actually kind of, you also actually need to maintain a, a temporary copy of this tuple and keep applying uh, the values back and so that you can restore a, a, a version of a tuple at a specific timestamp time based on those uh, deltas, right? <laughs> and then that also leads to another uh, important property for this uh, delta storage is that as far as I know, people always implement delta storage from the newest to oldest, right? So that has a little bit of implication here. It's with, which is because, exactly like I said, in order to acquire a specific version of the tuple, you always need to apply the changes to that tuples back to that tape tuple from the newest to oldest, right? So you can organize this version chain from oldest to newest, that's fine. You can all still locate a tuple from the oldest to newest. But after you locate that tuple, you still need to go to the latest version of that tuple and then apply all the changes back. Right, so it's kind of like a redundant if you uh, go with oldest to newest, but in from newest to oldest, while you are trying to locate this tuple, you also maintain or restore the values uh, of this uh, tuple in the meantime, right? So you just start killing two birds with one stone. All right, that makes sense? All right. <laughs> so uh, the uh, next topic is that also, again, very important is that in this multivariant concurrency control method, one obvious issue is that you just keep accumulating variance, right? And then after your system running a while, then you can have many, many variants, and then they can actually uh, take up a lot of space. And then you potentially, uh, you, 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 most of the time, you want to shrink this space and so that I mean, you can free up space I mean, for your database system to store I mean, regular records, right? Instead of just these uh, variants. And then that's just be called uh, reclaim, right? So the system needs to essentially need to reclaim all those uh, physical variants uh, older in time. <laughs> and essentially there are two types of uh, physical variance that we can reclaim. The first type is that for all the variance that no active transactions can see that variance or, or would be able to access that variance anymore, then we can reclaim, reclaim all of this, right? Because time is always advancing, right? If right now there's no transaction that's old enough to fit its timestamp to the current range of, of my, my tuple, right, of, of this version of my tuple, then the later transaction won't fit in this range anymore either, right? So then just uh, safely reclaim a, a version of the tuple that cannot be seen by anyone. Uh, and then the second type of version, obviously, is that if the transaction aborted, then the versions that it, it, it created would, would just uh, can be reclaimed, right? And then there are two design decision questions that we are going to answer. The first is that how do we find out the uh, expired variance of the tuples, and then how do we uh, reclaim these tuples safely, all right? So there are, at a high level, there are two types of approach. Uh, 
Right? One is at a tuple level, the other is at transaction level. So the tuple level, again, uh, at, uh, at high level just means that you're going to examine in the, each individual tuple, right? And look at, hey, can, can I reclaim this or not? Can I reclaim that tuple or not? Can I reclaim that tuple or not? And then uh, so on and so forth. Uh, again, I'll, I'll give you details. And then for the transaction level, it just means that instead of looking at each individual tuple, I'm going to look at for each transaction, what kind of new versions that it created, as well as what kind of old versions uh, it overwritten, right? Because I mean, if a version became old, it must be overwritten by some transaction, right? And then change the version chain. So, at, so by that, with these transactions, we, if we keep track of those information, then at a higher level, uh, based on the timestamp transaction, we can directly locate, hey, what records have been uh, invalidated by which transaction? and then uh, directly uh, uh, reclaim those records as, those, uh, as we uh, organize those transactions instead of looking at individual tuple uh, separately. All right, this is like a two uh, high, level, high level approach. And then uh, another thing to mention is that uh, for the uh, tuple level, there are actually two uh, different choices, right? Either you can do, you can look at each individual tuple with a background thread, right? Just to keep looping, look at individual tuple, or you can do that cooperatively, co cooperatively, right? Which means that while different transactions are reading those variant chains, right, to access to tuples, you can, uh, along when that happens, you can just uh, uh, remove the unnecessary version of the tuple when you identify them unnecessary, right? While you are trying to traverse those variant chain. So again, it's kind of like uh, something that you can, transactions can conveniently do while they are uh, executing instead of having this separate background thread, all right? So uh, first, I'll talk about the uh, tuple level garbage collection. So give you this uh, specific example, say that uh, we have uh, two threads uh, that are managing um, two uh, different transactions. The first transaction has ID 12, the second transaction has ID 25, and we have uh, three tuples here, one version for tuple A, and then two versions for tuple B, all right? <laughs> and then here, we are going to uh, look at the background of vacuum first, right? Essentially, a separate vacuum thread is going, is going to go through each individual tuple in this table and look at, hey, whether I can reclaim it or not. And then, by the way, this works with any um, storage format, right? It doesn't, doesn't matter whether it's uh, delta storage, append only, uh, or like time travel table, right? Then it can work for any of them, right? So when uh, this uh, vacuum thread comes along, Right, what we will do is that it will look at uh, what would be the uh, current running transactions and their IDs, right? And it can obviously to find a uh, smallest ID, right? Or find, find, I mean, just to record the ID of the uh, all running transactions, right? And then it can go through each individual tuple on the right, right? For example, first, it can look at, hey, whether the begin, whether there's any transaction would fit into the begin and end, end timestamp of my uh, first uh, version of the tuple, tuple A, right, called A100, right? And it doesn't fit. And similarly, for the um, second version of the tuple, it doesn't fit either, right? But, but the scan, while the scanning, it realized, hey, hey uh, for the third tuple with the tuple B101, I mean, the, it, uh, the JRDR transaction could fit in its range, right? So what it will do is that it will just reclaim the space for the first two uh, tuples, right? And then give full that up, all right? Make sense? <laughs> so one thing that is a little bit more clever is that I think it's actually pretty clever. It's actually from Postgres is that, well, obviously it, it's just uh, very, very costly to scan all the tuples in a table, right? Or once in a while, right? So what Postgres does is that Instead of just blindly scanning all the tuples, it actually maintain a uh, dirty block bitmap, right? To see that, to keep track of, hey, from the last time I start this vacuuming, right, and try to reclaim all the all the all the I mean un unused versions, then from that time, what would be the pages that have been modified uh, by different transactions, right? So the next time when Postgres needs to do the vacuum, it only needs to scan through the pages that have been modified since the last time vacuuming started, right? It doesn't really need to scan through all the pages. So this can greatly uh, save uh, the time cost for the vacuum, right? which, which I think is uh, actually pretty clever, all right? So the second approach I kind of mentioned 
will be a cooperative clinic, right? So again, like I mentioned before, instead of I mean, having a background thread always like looping through all those two posts, all the dirty pages, we can actually let different transactions to identify versions that are no longer be uh, useful while they are traversing the version chain, trying to find the correct versions of two posts that they want to access, right? So by the way, this only works with the oldest uh, to the newest, right? Because I mean, from the newest to oldest, then there could be oldest tuple that you're never going to need to read, right? Then you can you're just never going to reclaim them. All right. So here, for example, right? Uh, let's say uh, still we have these, uh, I mean, two transactions, right? Transaction uh, one, for example, that's what we are going to focus on. And let's let's say eight uh, wants to access uh, the value of uh, tuple A with this index, right? So through this index, it can first locate the head of this version chain, right? So now, while it is traversing this version chain, right, it's from the newest, uh, sorry, sorry, from the oldest to the newest, it can identify that, hey, uh, the specific version of the tuple may have a timestamp that is, in the timestamp, that is already smaller than any of my current running transactions. Right? So sort of maintain a watermark of what is the smallest ID or timestamp of all the currently running transactions. And then if you realize that, hey, no current running transactions have a watermark or timestamp that is smaller than the end timestamp of a zero, well, you can just uh, destroy it right, while you are doing the scanning. And similarly, right, you, you destroy whatever records you identify that is like no longer be accessible by any active transaction and you just uh, remove them and then redirect your version chain uh, to this newest version, all right? To the newer version, all right? Make sense? Okay. So uh, next, just uh, briefly <laughs> for transaction level or garbage collection, again, it's a little bit uh, similar, well not similar, I sort of already described it a little bit earlier is that for each transaction, uh, Besides keep tracking of what is, has been written, what has been written, you're also going to uh, keep track of what will be the versions uh, that be invalidated by the update of this transaction, right? And then uh, based on that, you can actually uh, uh, reclaim all those versions altogether if this transaction is out of the scope, okay? So here, give you an example. Let's say uh, we have this uh, transaction, uh, two tuples, right? But it's a transaction uh, in the thread one. And it can, for example, just update the value of this version A, right? So what it does is that it will look at this version, create a new version, A3, right? And then it will keep track of this uh, version A2 that it has overwritten, right? So because the A2 is no longer a latest version anymore, at some point in time, we got to reclaim this, right? We don't know when yet, but we know that it will definitely be reclaimed at some point. So of course, we will keep track of the pointer here as well, right? Uh, similarly, B come along, right, write a new version, and then keep track of this version B as well, right? So when this transaction commit, what we'll do is that it will send these um, two different versions, right, as well as this uh, commit and begin and commit ID of this transaction, right, to the uh, specific vacuum component of the database system, right? Then this, when this, <laughs> Well, you still need actually need a vacuum thread in this case, right? But in just instead of the vacuum thread go over in each individual tuple, what you do is that it will just go over the transactions that have finished, right? And then when it realizes that all the transactions, all the current running transactions have an ID greater than 15, then it can already know that all the um, all the versions that is that are kept or that are invalidated by the transactions with a commit ID smaller than 15, they can all be freed, right? Because no other transaction will need to access them anymore. Instead of going through individual tuples, it can directly locate what version of tuples have been invalidated by earlier transactions and direct, directly free them up. All right? Make sense? <laughs> so so sorry, this, for this lecture, we, need, we still need to go over like uh, three, five minutes, right? I apologize for that. And because I, I don't want to go to the next card because I want to finish this, right? So another thing I want to mention is that because uh, you now have a different versions of tuples, you now need to manage them, how to interact with them with the index, right? Uh, so essentially what we do with the index is that when we're trying to update a version of the tuple, what we will do is that obviously we need to update 
the uh, corresponding pointer in the index that pointing to the height of the burn chain, right? So what we need to do is that we need to do a delete followed by the insert, right? We first need to delete that tuple and then insert that tuple back again with the correct head of the uh, burn chain. <laughs> and it's at least in, in the primary key index, that's what we need to do. But for secondary index, that's actually different choices, right? Different systems do different things. And that's actually exactly why um, Uber well, that's, that's, that's switched all their uh, database, or for switched their database that they are using from uh, Postgres to MySQL a few years ago. It's exactly because uh, Postgres have an inefficient way to manage uh, these uh, uh, pointers, especially in the secondary indexes for this different version of tuples for their use case, right? So they had to do this uh, expensive switch, start from Postgres and then switch uh, to MySQ. <laughs> so uh, essentially, again, like I mentioned before, for primary index, right, you always have to have a pointer to point to the head of the version chain and you need to do a delete followed by update, sorry, followed by insert. <laughs> but for secondary indexes, there are two different choices, right? You can either do this logically or do this physically, and they have different trade-offs. Logical pointer would be that instead of directly uh, pointing to the head of the version chain, you can sort of store a logical identifier of this tuple. Could either be the primary key of, uh, of this tuple or some indirection tuple ID, right? So when you are updating the head of the version chain, you only need to update that indirection based on this tuple ID instead of updating the actual uh, value in every secondary index, right? But the second approach obviously would be that you directly update the value in the secondary indexes. Then when you are changing the head of the version chain, you actually need to go through all the secondary indexes, including the primary index, and then do a delete followed by insert, which could potentially be costly, right? Let me just quickly illustrate this, right? Put in the, in the, in the first approach, right, in the index pointer, so what you will do is that in the, uh, well, again, assuming that we are doing a append only and a newest to oldest, right? So we are only appending the newest version to the, to the, to the head of the version chain. So here, right, let's say the, the, the primary index wants to uh, update, get this uh, value, right? Then what would uh, the primary index do is it just will always store the physical address, right? Because you have to store the uh, version pointer, physical version pointer somewhere, right? But then, so how we store that? But then for the secondary index, what it can do is that it can either right, directly st store the physical address and then link to that, uh, to that um, head of the version chain. But the problem, like I mentioned, is that what if you have many, many secondary index, right? Then in this case, for each secondary index, you have to store a pointer. And when you modify the head of the version chain, you have to go back to individual secondary index and then do a delete followed by insert for each single one of them to flip the version chain, right? <laughs> so instead, what you can do is that, for example, you can use a logical pointer here. This here could be a primary key. Then you just insert, essentially store the primary key of each tuple as the value in your index, right? Then every time you need to look up that tuple, you actually first look up the secondary index and then you get the primary key, you do a second, you do another lookup on the primary key index to look at that tuple. What well, the advantage would be that you only need to flip the pointer on the primary key index, right? Of course, you can also use a separate data structure uh, to store a logical, you, essentially you can add a, a different indirection layer and then uh, add this pointer there, but that's actually uh, less common, right? Uh, because that's just add additional management overhead. It's almost like you are maintaining a third index, right? That, that is uh, less common. And then um, here, another, I think it's the last issue, right? Which would be um, that when you are storing this, um, this uh, multi-version uh, tuples in the index, right? The one tricky problem is that, again, the index doesn't really know you, are, you have different versions of a tuple, right? So say you want to insert a tuple in this index, and then there's already, there already exists a, a, a tuple in, with this key in the index. You just don't really know, hey, whether this version is from a different transaction, whether it's committed or not, or whether it's from an earlier version committed, uh, inserted by the same transaction, right? You just don't have that information, so there can be issues, right? So here I just want to give you uh, one particular example of what could be the potential issue in the index. So here, say that you have a transaction, you have just one table, uh, one tuple, tuple A, right? And then, so for example, you have the first transaction, right? Just do a read on A, right? That's very easy, right? Second transaction, come along, do an update on, on A, right? Also very easy, right? You just uh, uh, modify the version chain and then uh, uh, install the new version, right? And say the second transaction here, it wants to do a delete, right? So what 
so this is fine, right? So assuming that, uh, so we are not going to go to the details, but assuming that we just use a mark, right, to notify, to, to uh, illustrate, to, or to mark that this tuple has been deleted by the second transaction, right, that's fine, and the second transaction can commit, right, I mean, because this is perfectly fine. The problem would happen is that what if now there's a third transaction come back and then try to insert this version A, right? So the tricky thing here is that because we are doing multi versioning when we delete the second, this record A by the second transaction, there may still be other transactions, for example, access version A, right, still be reading, and then we cannot just directly delete this um, version A right, right away, right? We have to wait for the uh, garbage collection process we talked about earlier to reclaim this version. So now, when the transaction three wants to insert this version A, it can insert, but then in the index, there's already a, a there, right? So there are essentially would be two versions or two version chains of this A exist, right? And, the, and of course, you can deal with that, but just the additional complication that would involve uh, if you have a multi-version, and then uh, in this scenario, you have to deal with the, the, the case that there are actually, there could be duplicate case uh, for the for this specific record here, all right? And uh, yeah, that's essentially uh, summarize what I talk about. And then the solution, again, very high level, we're not going to de go into details, right? Then the solution we are going to uh, apply here is that essentially we are just going to uh, lock this transaction, right? So when, a, uh, when we delete a key, uh, from uh, this, uh, from delete a key from this table, we're not going to allow any uh, new transaction to insert anything to this table uh, unless we commit, right? Then after that, we can continue. And then you can uh, either uh, use a deleted flag or use a, uh, usually you can either use a flag or specific attribute in the tuple to denote that uh, this key has been deleted Right, like, but that would actually be a additional uh, either bit or attribute in the tuple itself. Or a different approach is that you have a tombstone version, right? Which would be that you append a new version of this tuple to the uh, version chain, but this is a spe special version of the tuple that uh, that has a null value that represent that this tuple has been deleted. Right? And then when that is happening, you are not going to allow any new insert uh, to this uh, ta table on this tuple anymore unless the transaction has committed. And then just uh, this is the last slide, right? Essentially, uh, this want to have, just want to show you a summarization on uh, what kind of combinations of protocols, version storage, garbage caching, and indexes that the different systems use to implement uh, multi-version concurrency control uh, within combination with the concurrency control protocol protocols we talked about earlier. And, and essentially, I mean, different systems, you can see, use various different things, right? They have different trade-offs on different workloads. And uh, just, uh, I mean, we talk about different trade-offs they may have uh, in this class. And then in practice, you just got to uh, pick and choose, right? So as a conclusion, MECC is uh, widely uh, used, right? very, very important organization, used in uh, so many uh, modern database systems, and then different combinations will give you uh, different trade-offs. And even for some NoSQL systems, right, I mean, they don't even support multi-statement transactions. For example, uh, uh, yeah, for example, NoSQL systems, uh, they would actually, many of them still use um, multi-version to improve their performance. All right, so uh, that's all today. Yeah. Okay. Talking about the St. Ives brew, run through a can or two. Share with my crew is magnificent, plus it's mellow. And for the rest of the commercial, I pass the mic on to my fellow. No fellow. need for a mic check, bust it. The fees are set, then grab a 40. The flim New York and snap his neck. St. Ives. Take a sip, then wipe your lips. Cue my 40's getting warm. I'm out, he got the dip. Drink it, drink it, drink it, then I burp. After I slurp, ice cube, I put in much work. With the BMT and the E-Trouble, get us a St. Ives brew on the double. 